the economic nest got hijacked by the cuckoo goal of GDP growth. Uh, and she starts talking about the economics being formed um, in ancient Greece as a science. And uh, economics was the art of managing a household. And it was actually clearly distinguished from chromatics or schematics, the art of uh, acquiring wealth. And what Kate Rayworth is saying is that now it seems like we have completely blurred or lost that distinction. You know, now if you think about economics, it is it is hardwired and quite strongly so to thinking about the ways of growth and the measure of growth that is uh, chosen and has been kind of the the go to um, option is the gross domestic product GDP. So Adam Smith says that uh, economics has two distinct objects to supply a plentiful revenue or subsistence for the people or more properly to enable them to provide such revenue or subsistence for themselves. And secondly, to supply the state or commonwealth with a, with a revenue sufficient for public service. Um, and I think this definition of economics uh, is, is really broad and all encompassing and it's um, actually kind of define the what Adam Smith is known for, which is kind of a, you know, free market, the invisible hand uh, and things of that nature. So he had a, a quite a holistic picture of what economics should be. I think now it's fair to say that we have definitely departed from uh, that definition. Now the definition that you are most likely to see in kind of the textbooks of economics uh, is economics is the science uh, which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. So Kate is saying that one of the main reasons um, of the fact that we have lost the original definition of economics uh, is the concept of utility. And utility is, is, is defined as kind of satisfaction or happiness that a person can get from purchasing a certain service or product. And then very quickly, economists kind of form this trail of thought that, you know, the more utility you have, the happier you are, the better the economy is doing. Uh, and the way to get more utility uh, and to satisfy kind of your, your preferences and the, the, the choices that you make and the products and services that you choose is to produce more of those products and services for people to consume more of them. So in 1930s, right, when the, the economists kind of decided what the discipline is about, um, the American government, I think, commissioned Simon Kuznets to devise a measure of the growth of American economy. And what Kuznets came up with was gross national product. And uh, it's slightly different from GDP uh, in the sense that GDP only covers what is produced in the certain economy or in a certain country. And then this is how the rivalry of two ideologies, two economic models, one is free market, uh, that the US was the most avid representative of, and another one was central planning that was uh, at the time starting probably from 1950s um, all the way until up to the demise of the Soviet Union. What was I saying? Did I say that the Soviet Union was representative of central planning? I probably did. So you've got free market, uh, US, Soviet Union, central plan. And uh, actually in the other books now, digressing a bit, um, I can't remember which book it was, but I remember reading about a British uh, journalist or British um, economic commentator going to the Soviet Union, and uh, I think it was the during the times of Nikita Khrushchev, and then uh, you know he went to the Soviet Union to see what the economy is like to to interview the leader, and he came back to the UK and he said that he saw the future, and um, you know a lot of the Western experts were extremely bullish on the idea um, of the central plan and, and Soviet Union was actually showing the fact that it does work in their own um, growth of the economy uh, but due to a multitude of reasons uh, that growth was short lasting and soon the whole construct fell apart and about why it fell apart you can actually read in a book called Why Nations Fail uh, by James Robinson and Durham Ajimolu that actually explains the reasons behind why central planning system didn't really work out in the long run. But uh, anyways, not to digress. So Simon Kuznets comes up with the gross national product. And then this was basically considered a staple 
of how well the economy is doing and the economists just kind of ran with it and they have been running with it up until now, slightly modifying into GDP rather than GNP. One of the things that actually surprised me and it was a, a revelation to me actually, no, I think I have read about it in uh, Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, but I didn't know the extent to which it was the case, was the fact that Simon Kuznets himself actually did not believe in this, you know, be all, be all and all growth goal at all. Um, in fact, he was saying that um, Kuznets, Kate is, Kate is saying here that Kuznets was well aware of the limits of this ingenuous calculations from the outset, emphasizing that national income captured only the market value of goods and services produced in an economy. He pointed out that it therefore excluded the enormous value of goods and services produced by and for households and by society in the course of daily life. He recognized that it gave, and this is this is absolutely key, and it's just mental that the fact that this is not kind of known and this was not paid attention to in the kind of the mainstream economics thinking. He recognized that it gave no indication of how income and consumption were actually distributed between the households. First, Kuznets is an absolute legend, right? He's the he's the father of the uh, national income accounting and of, of the GNP and consequently GDP. So he is in the in the Hall of Fame, and I believe he got the, uh, the the Nobel Prize or something of this nature, and he did deserve it. Um, but you know the fact that it doesn't tell anything about the consumption or actually the, the well-being of the households and how that income is distributed, why does it even even matter, like, post-Cold War? Why does it even matter to have a, you know, a, an economy grow in its GDP at a certain rate? Like, what does it do? It doesn't really do much in terms of the personal experiences that we as citizens uh, have every day. And Kate here is just drawing a, a diagram that um, so many economists are kind of dreaming of, which is the inwards and upwards, you know, infinite growth of GDP. And I'm so dark here at the back. My camera is so good at this. So Kuznets said that welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measure of national income, saying that the welfare of a certain economy should not be inferred from GDP. Yet, look at us, this is exactly uh, what we're doing. Um, now there is a, a line, a trail of thought, uh, and has been going on for you know, maybe for a decade or so from early 20th century, definitely post-financial crisis. The fact that GDP is actually not a perfect measure, yet we're just so, and it includes me, we're just so used to it. It is it is crazy. Like, even I, when we're talking about, uh, you know, how well the economy is doing, like, this is the first thing you look at. GDP per capita, like, what else would you look at? There is plenty of other characteristics uh, and factors and we that make much more sense, and we will get to them in a bit. And again, crucially, Kuznets said that distinctions uh, must be kept in mind. This was back in 1960s. Between quantity and quality of the growth, between its cost and return, and between the short term and the long term. Objectives should be explicit. Goals for more growth should specify growth of what and for what. This is Simon Kuznets who's saying this, the creator of gross national income. What are we talking about here? Then quite interestingly, uh, Kate Rayworth goes on to saying that it's not quite that the, you know, the leaders and the, the people don't understand that this is not the great measure, uh, you know, the GDP um, as a goal in of itself. But she's saying that we're so addicted to this notion of growth that even when we try to make it kind of you know sustainable green long term it is still growth so that she is citing you know angela merkel is talking about sustained growth david cameron proposed balanced growth barack obama favored long-term lasting growth the world bank promised inclusive green growth so it's just like growth uh, is the inherent component of whatever we are trying to achieve and then we add you know the new kind of trendy words like green and sustained uh, in order to dress it up as something that it actually isn't because in the end growth is is is, is still the goal and when we're talking growth we're definitely talking about a measure of national uh, accounting such as GDP. The, the measure of growth uh, is an inherently flawed one we need a new one we need a new model to 
uh, kind of the to, to judge whether the economy is doing well or not because we can't just be you know kind of scraping the GDP and then saying you know what is next how do we know if we're doing well even like what do we use so the model of the economy that uh, Kate presents and this is uh, you know at the heart of the book is the donut and you can just have a brief look here so this is the donut and this is safe and just space for the humanity right right in the middle of the donut here inside is the social foundation such as energy water food health education etc on the outside is the ecological ceiling you know and the some of the things that are pushing against that ceiling are climate change land conversion biodiversity loss air pollution and others what we intend to do is not to overshoot and not to shortfall. So not to shortfall on these basic kind of principles and not to overshoot uh, into depleting uh, the resources of our planet. Basically to be in the donut. Uh, and then Kate goes on to kind of exploring uh, which areas of the donut we are already overshooting or are shortfalling on. I'll give an example, uh, shortfall of peace and justice, shortfall of uh, gender equality. We're overshooting on climate change and uh, biodiversity loss and things of that nature. This is more, I think, I think this bit was a bit more, uh, even though it was based on data, it was probably a bit more speculative and a bit more subjective. But it is, you know, it is clear to me that we're probably pushing the boundaries, the ecological and cultural. So 21st century will be absolutely key in terms of the development of the world order uh, and the way we should structure our societies. And I think, um, well, not I think, I think huh? it was Joanne Rockstorm uh, that quite rightly said, and I, and I really like this quote, she's saying that we are the first generation to know that we are undermining the ability of the Earth system to support human development. This is a profound new insight and it's potentially very, very scary. It is also an enormous privilege because it means that we are the first generation to know that we now need to navigate a transformation to a globally sustainable future. You know, if you think about the topics such as sustainability, you know, climate change, sustained growth, long-term growth, inclusive growth, non-discrimination, these are relatively new concepts. And I think that for our generation, these are the concepts that really hit home and that it happens so that they have developed at a disproportionate pace and they take disproportionate amount of space in our hearts and minds compared to, you know, if you think about the 21st century, it was a period of complete devastation. I mean, it's two wars that were just beyond horrific and then a cold war that was super scary and then we had to come up with something and it was growth and then we actually achieved some ridiculous, absolutely old time progress and we should be so proud of ourselves for like lifting so many people out of poverty, you know, for actually managing to, in most parts of the world, and um, in some places we are doing it worse than in the others, but on, on, a, on a large scale we managed to kind of keep the peace um, and prevent an, an all out war like the First World War or the Second World War even to a larger extent. So we should be super happy about it. But um, we are actually the first generation that has the data and has the unequivocal, uh, undebatable proof that things are not actually going as planned. And if we continue at this pace, uh, we are not going to be where we want to be.